They are on and off. Well, this is actually something really big to talk about. And uh, when Spread Museum contacted me and asked me to, you know, come here and do one of their programs, I was like, I don't know, what should I talk about? There's plenty of things we should be talking about. And uh, a lot of things that many people actually do not understand, or in some way, because right now Chinese, with Chinese economy power and everything, and uh, China tries to extend what you call soft power to the world. Maybe I don't need this. Is that okay? I can just yeah. 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 <laughs> So, so I was, I was thinking, what should I talk about it? And then I finally chose this topic to talk about because I find it's quite important now, especially today, uh, that I feel that more people should come to an understanding what this propaganda is, how this is working. And to a certain extent, we understand how this is working. China has money. China will try to tell you, okay, no talk about Tibet. China will try to tell the world leaders not to, the, not to meet the Dalai Lama. And uh, because if you're going to meet the Dalai Lama, we're going to stop you know, business with you and so on. This is the other side of the propaganda. But then there's another aspect of the propaganda that's going on, that's happening inside Tibet as well as China at large. It's something people usually don't understand, of course, because most of this is in all of that in Chinese, on the website, internet, and everywhere. And so I feel it's quite important since, you know, this is to some point quite ridiculous, the kind of propaganda that you use inside Tibet and try to tell the Tibetan people. So I find it's quite interesting for people to, you know, see the aspect of that kind of the propaganda. And but first, maybe I can just. Yeah, no. Problem. Okay. Um. So first, I don't know how many of you here understand uh, to what extent the situation of Tibet and as well as its history. So I feel it's not that I don't think you all understand it in many ways, but I feel like, you know, just generally I, I feel like it's important to first explain to you the Tibet that I'm talking about today here. And can you, can you click that thing? <laughs> Next to rest of <coughs> Next. Next. Well, see, from the map it's quite obvious that this is the Tibet I'm talking about. This whole area. That these two and this one too. And to China, the Chinese government usually Tibet refers to only this yellow part. The central Tibet. They call it Tibetan Autonomous Region. And, but the Tibet that I'm talking about is what we call the Tibet, the tri that includes the three provinces, regions of Tibet, traditional regions of Tibet, and this is the Tibet that I'm talking about. And uh, to have an idea of how big this is, they say it's uh, the outside of uh, Tibet is one-fourth of China today. And uh, some people say it's twice the size of Western Europe, but I don't know how big this, this is, but you will have some idea about it. And to have some idea how big this is, I can go to the next. So this, oh, it goes up again. It zoomed out picture, a map of Tibet. You can tell with the neighboring countries, China, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and this is how big Tibet is. So this is uh, Tibet I'm talking about today. And uh, before that, um, I just want to share a little bit, just throw a little bit light on the history of, of Tibet since Chinese invasion. And we know that in 1949, China, Chinese People's Republic of China was established. And soon after that, 1949, and soon after that, Chinese Mao says that, well, our army should continue to advance for, towards the western part of China, which is where today's Tibet is. 
and to liberate those people living in the most barbaric, <laughs> most backward, and the darkest society in the world. Because he needed a reason and an excuse to send his armies there to conquer that part of the land, which is not at all a part of China, but he needed a reason to legitimate uh, this war against Tibetans. So that's one of the reasons, apart from the official jargons they always use, that <coughs> Tibet is an inseparable part of China since ancient time, actually. That's, that's what they say all the time, ancient time. I don't know how far it goes back to, but that's the reason that they, that they use to, to conquer Tibet. And can we go to next? <laughs> but then we all know that media in China is censored. And literally, there is no freedom of expression existing in, at all in that Middle Kingdom. But then, what we do not understand on another way is that China is good at really manipulating media. And China says, well, in this time of the era, we cannot just stop everybody, 1.3 billion in China, from using internet. Why don't we just let them use internet? But the internet and the content of it closely monitored, tactically filtered by the Chinese government to present you a freedom. So people will think, oh, well, you say we don't have freedom? We do. We have all kinds of freedom. You have, we have Googles here. And Chinese says Baidu. This is the Chinese search engine, which is, like I said, closely monitored and filtered, and all the contents that try to, especially when it's related to Tibet, it's, it's all the government version. But then, the thing is, Chinese people can still try to search it. If they want to search on Baidu, the Chinese search engine about Tibet, and a whole lot of things comes down, and that's all about what China says of Tibet. And then, when we, when we have when we have Facebook, we do Facebook, everybody, this is part of our life nowadays, and, uh, well, Chinese says, well, we have two, that kind of version of Facebook, and this is the next one. This is the Renren Chinese version of Facebook, and uh, actually, to register on this Facebook, this Chinese version of Facebook, nowadays you need uh, your um, real identity. Here it says, okay, who the man or woman, birth of dead of birth, and especially this part is very interesting. It says, they need your national identity card number on it. So that means, in any case, you want to say anything that, is, that goes against the policy of the government, you'll be immediately tracked down in no effort. And then, of course, we have, uh, we have uh, Twitter here, and Chinese have Weibo, that's Chinese version of Twitter. And we have uh, YouTube, and they have uh, Yuku. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's what they say, it's Yuku. That's, that's what Chinese version of YouTube is. So basically, to understand, the reason I'm explaining this is to have an idea that when we talk about censorship, when we talk about freedom of media, we're not talking about, in China, like any other totalitarian regimes, there is no internet at all. We're not talking about it. There is. They are good at it, and they, they, they pretty much duplicate all those, and pretty much present to the people of China a feeling of freedom that they can enjoy. And one of the... To highlight this, this, this sort of phenomenon there, I think one of the jobs that would be quite interesting to talk about. So, uh, two guys, American guy and Chinese guy, talking about the freedom that they can enjoy. And the American guy says to the Chinese guy, I could go to White House, outside the White House, I can protest <coughs> against my president. And the Chinese guy says, we too have that freedom, I can go to Tiananmen Square, and protest against your president. <laughs> so this is, this is the phenomenon today in China. And uh, to talk about then, of course, being a Tibetan, I feel like, uh, you know, whenever we talk about issues, politics, anything, at the end of the day, it comes to Tibet, my country. And I want to talk about what it is like inside Tibet. But in order to understand the propaganda, how that works inside Tibet, I feel like it's 
it's quite important. Even though I don't really want to go back to the history and again go for hours sitting there and feeling tired, but still, let me just briefly talk a little bit about the history since Chinese invasion. I'm talking about this uh, because this is so important to understand the context. Under this context, how the propaganda is working today in Tibet by Chinese government. So Mao, like I said, using all those excuses to liberate those poor people living in these terrible conditions, we have to send our troops to Tibet. Besides, you know, Tibet is part of China, that's what they say all the time. So the China, People's Liberation Army came to Tibet. 1950, we say we officially lost our country in 1959, but Chinese invasion or annexation of Tibet actually was taken in a greater process since 1950s. That was within a year after the People's Republic of China was founded, actually. So they see how important it is to expand their territories to the or vast western part of China, which is where Tibet is today. And then they came, so with their red flags, their banners, their... But then they said, we are going to go there and, you know, start liberating the Tibetans, and they call it uh, peaceful liberation of Tibet. But the peaceful liberation was not a peaceful at all. The Chinese occupation of Tibet, I'm sure many of you just have gone around in the museum and saw pictures and so on, just throw some bit of light on it, that the result in the destruction of 6,000, more than 6,000 Tibetan monasteries across Tibetan plateau, and uh, statues of Buddhas were damaged, dismantled, and uh, shifted to, 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 to China for industrial use those times. I'm talking about the times in 50s and 60s, those times. And they dismantle all those, and they shift all the way to, to China for those industrial use. And uh, of course, Tibetan artifacts, religious artifacts, with a thousand years of history, it's, you know, they're talking about, you know, many of the Tibetan scriptures that you see, they're not talking about only the religious content in there. There's also philosophies in there, medicines in there, philosophy, uh, astrology, and so many, you know, the kind of Tibetan civilizations all included in there are all were destroyed because they think, because they're bringing their new idea into Tibet. The new idea. That new idea, new ideology should never be challenged by any existing idea or concept in the area. So they have to destroy it to rebuild the image. So that's what they did. And mirrors, beautiful mirrors on the walls of the monasteries that's been there for a thousand years were destroyed and left with the scars like this. So the whole, like I said, the only reason that they try to do all this is not just try to eliminate the culture and to try to occupy the land and the people there, but also try to basically eradicate the concept you have, the identity you have as a Tibetan at all from the surface of the earth. And they tried really hard and they did it. And they almost brought the entire Tibetan civilization to an end during those times of madness, I would say. And the, so they want to bring their revolution, their ideal to, to Tibet, their ideology to Tibet. And they started spreading it. After the killing and everything conquer, conquering is done, they start spreading ideas with the portrait of Mao, making the Tibetans to carry it. Um, mass parade is taking place all across Tibet. And to try to tell the people in the land who never heard of anything other than Buddhism and its notion about cause and effect. And then they brought a new idea called communism and its ideology and tried to install this into the mind of people forcefully. And of course, if you don't listen to them, you do you not know, cover with them, that's what happened to you. And they're going to take you to what they call the public criticization session, right? Mm -hmm. And basically, they gather all the villagers around the area and say, okay, this guy was the oppressor, this guy tortured you, this guy took all you have, and now we here, we are supporting you to smash down those peoples who the Chinese call the oppressors of the Tibetan people to save you guys from here. And that's what they did. But then, you know, the part is just the history of it. And I don't... Um, 
basically killing destruction that was taking place inside Tibet alone is not going to work and the Chinese too understand it so they need some sort of what I call the propaganda they have to mobilize all of it to tell the people that you have to feel grateful because we're here, we saved you they like a seven, you know and then the idea, the notion come and of course mass killing and as well they call old Tibet and new Tibet I don't know if it makes sense in English but <laughs> old Tibet means like I said before the, Chinese, before the Chinese invasion of Tibet the most barbaric, the darkest the backward, most backward society is called old Tibet by the Chinese version of their term and then of course the new Tibet is there that's after the Chinese came and of course old Tibet you know, people poor, lying on the street, they're begging, and plus, with this black and white photo, it looks so bad. The life, the sufferings that Tibetans were, you know, undergoing in, during those times before Chinese invaded Tibet, you know. So this is what they try to tell you, look how poor you are, and this old man was actually the... It goes all the way up there, the caption, anyway. Um, so the, they, they try to, this is, these are really from the Chinese website that I just collect here and there and here and there. And with the caption, it's quite interesting to say this old man was almost dying and was starving, but still he was on the street begging food and this is the society you guys used to live. And they try to install this idea to the mind of the people. And then... <laughs> Here, here we are, and we can, we try to save you, and it's our happy Tibetans, smiling Tibetans, welcoming the liberations of Tibet by the Chinese, and uh, welcoming the Chinese troops into Tibet, holding high the portrait of Chairman Mao and the Chinese army general here, and uh, this is why we're here, and you people really loved us to be here. And this is the portrait, this is part of the propaganda they try to you know, spread across Tibet, not just Tibet, and even in China. And not just that, not the portrait itself, and people have to work in the farm, carrying the portrait of Mao, so that they, they, they hope that they can get more blessings, in a way, so that the harvest was, would be better, and so on. <laughs> and people are happy, and they're wearing flowers at the square, to welcome the establishment of New Tibet. And kids are happy, obviously, with the, 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 the red scarves on their, around their neck. By the way, this red scarf, when I was in school in Tibet, we were told that red scarf is a piece from the national flag that is stained with the blood of the revolutionary heroes that fight for the founding of the People's Republic of China. So by wearing this red flag, you are supposed to be the best student, you're supposed to be the the most out outstanding student in your class. And it was a sort of pride for us to be able to, you know, wear that. <laughs> but you have to be qualified for that, right? And, uh, and that's not alone. And the funny thing is, of course, propaganda comes in different forms. Those times there was no internet and so on. But there's stage, there's drama, there's uh, music that they can create uh, during those times, you know? And this is one of the... One of the Tibetan, they call us daughter of a serf, or slave, that was liberated and later became a singer that everybody in China loved. And she was invited to all the way to Beijing, to those like mega galas, to sing songs, to express the gratitude of Tibetan peoples towards the Chairman Mao. And one of her music at that time that she sang was called Redience of Chairman Mao. And the Larry goes, since the radiance, the shining, you know, the bright, shining radiance of Chairman Mao shines on the top of Snow Mountain, which basically means Tibet. And Tibetan people are blessed with a life of happiness. And they try to tell you, this is the happiness we're bringing to you. So, those are back in 50s, 60s that's what's happening inside Tibet and then we will wonder so what's going on inside 
today in Tibet. Because those times, it was a time of madness. There was a cultural revolution, there was all those Mao's political campaigns were going on, and even today in China, people are questioning about it. So that must be their mistake. But what about today in Tibet? And I would say, the only difference from those times and today is the photos from black white to color and digital and internet we can use. Other than that, when it comes to the propaganda of China, nothing changed at all in Tibet. And that was a few months ago when I read a news about the North Korea and talking about the North Korean Kim Jong-un executed his uncle and he used all those languages about this barbaric, this traitor kind of, and the whole world was shocked to see the kind of extent of the language they used. And I was like, that's not surprising at all. This is the kind of language that China has been using inside Tibet since the invasion, invasion until today, they are using it. For example, this old man, this is today, and for us, taken in 2014, I mean 2012, around that time, according to the news report of the Chinese government. I took all those pictures, by the way, from the Chinese, you know, news media and so on, on from the internet. And for this, for example, this picture, it says, oh, it goes, it went all the way up there. And basically it says, this old man, the caption says, this old man is presenting a white scarf, the cut out ceremonial scarf, to the portrait of great leaders. And he always says that, uh, I will never forget the greatness of the party for my entire life. Now I'm living in such a beautiful house. I don't have to worry about food and clothing. It's all because, because of the sunshine of the Communist Party. That's what it really says on the caption. And that's, there's plenty of this kind of propaganda going on. And about how about the monks? Do they love the Communist Party? Yes, they do too, they say. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the, the portrait of the great leaders should be everywhere in every household of the Tibetan families. And then, and this one, the news report, the caption actually says, this monk, his name is Chang Ju. I don't know if that's real name or whatever. And he was supposedly quoted saying that every day he has to clean the portrait of the great leaders a number of times to feel his gratitude toward the party and the government. And that's really what caption says. I'm not making this up. <laughs> and of course, then how about we don't use, China said, we don't use People's Liberation Army to invade your country and kill your people. We also use them to help you people. When there's, you know, Tibetans are busy in the farm working, we will send our troops to help you, you know, with your with busy work. And that's what they do. And they send soldiers to the village and to the farm to work with the farmers. And, uh, and this is also, you know, they say, okay, the, the central party government, this is what I'm talking about today, 21st century, what's happening inside Tibet. And the farmers are, you know, the central government, they usually call central government, meaning the Beijing government. So the central government is so caring and concerned with the livelihood and well-being of the Tibetan people. And they donated a bunch of tractors for the farmers. So they started working in the farm. And the funny thing is, there's nothing wrong with working in the farm and donating a tractor to the farmers. And the funny thing is, for the propaganda use, the farmers are in their New Year's best dress <laughs> and with our Chinese flag on the tractor to work in the farm. Nobody will work in the farm in their best New Year's dress at all, right? We don't do that. But this is for, for propaganda purpose. They will do that. Yeah, so this is uh, about the... Uh, by the way, this photo was taken during a religious festival in Lhasa and uh, by some amateur photographers, but the photo was uh, put on the internet, somehow we managed to get it. Anyway, this is quite interesting to see half of the Buddha's image was behind the curtains, so, and people will try to worship on the other side of the line, and then in front of this, a line of the People's Liberation Army or the People's Armed Forces, you know, that's another division of people's uh, Chinese soldiers standing there guarding, just make sure nothing goes wrong, it, even if any gathering of Tibetans for any purpose. And they are always their persons. They will make their persons known to the people that, hey, we are around. 
don't do stupid, thing, stupid things. And that's why they try to send a message. But then they say, well, it seems that, you know, we don't believe in religion, we are atheist government, but then, how about, you know, we try to still compromise with you guys a bit when it comes to religion, and they say, well, why not? Let's do it. So, in, then they try to befriend with the Tibetan religious circles, and here, they are tried, this is what we call a award, awarding ceremony of a patriotic progressive monks and nuns. Do you understand that in English at all, actually? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the monks and nuns that China believe to be loyal to the Communist Party, and China believes that, China believes, I didn't say they are, but China at least, they believe are loyal to the Communist Party and respect the law and rules, are called the patriotic monks. Actually, talking about the patriotic education, that was started back in 19, like early 90s. They started the, this political campaign called Patriotic Education in Tibetan Monasteries. Because China believed that all the problems come from the religious circles of Tibetan communities. At one point, for Tibetans, monastery is not just an entity there with the monks and nuns doing pujas. For Tibetans, monastery is also the center of our civilization and culture. And it's the center of learning. You know, everything is there. So that poses a threat to the authority of the Communist Party, and they feel like they have to do something about it. So, of course, apart from destruction of the monasteries during the time of madness, and then they started carrying out what they call the patriotic education in Tibetan monasteries. And that was started in the late 90s. Basically, the concept of it is to send government officials, government officials to the monasteries across Tibet, stationed in the monasteries for a day, three, a month, depending on the situation, and carry out educations. So basically, they teach you, hey, you guys have to respect the law of the country. You should understand the constitution of People's Republic of China. You should be a good monk, a law-abiding monk, a patriotic monk. And this is what they've been doing in Tibetan monasteries. And as a result, we see you guys, you guys this Dashi monk is a good monk. Let's bring him to the Communist Party meeting and give him some award. Just say he's a progressive, patriotic monk. That's what they do. And of course, you know, in the senior government party meetings, sitting behind the lines are all the Chinese government uh, uh, communist officials, bosses sitting behind and in front of them, there are the monks in lines from different monasteries giving a word and, uh, you know, for a picture opportunity so that they can put on their internet and uh, government news outlet to tell how happy Tibetan peoples are. But then that alone is not going to help because these are the monks China think that we selected and we can we think we can trust. But how about the rest of the monks that that's still in Tibetan monasteries? And then they say, Well, there's no problem, we can send government officials to the monastery and like I said before, to carry out the education. So the government officials sometimes in a group of four, three, five, doesn't matter, and go to the monastery, even in the rural areas of the monasteries to carry out they call, what they call it, patriotic education campaigns and teaching, gather monks around and then teach them government laws and uh, so on. But on the other hand, also keep an eye on the daily activities of the monks to make sure nothing is going to happen that goes against the Chinese government policy. And then, apart from the religious circles in, in Tibet, we have also the farmers, nomads, what should we do about it? China is thinking about it. Of course, they also sent in 2012, China launched the biggest campaign ever in Tibet by sending more than 20,000 government officials into the Tibetan villages, rural areas, remote places to help the villagers improve their livelihood. That's what they say. But on the other hand, what we understand is they send government officials into the villages, stay there for a month, two, three, and repeatedly carrying out the government policies, the education on the government policies, and telling them that they should be 
law abiding they should receive in another word the law abiding basically means you can they didn't mean you cannot go steal things which may be included but basically you should respect what China says you should love the Communist Party and this is the kind of policies they are carrying out so in 2012 they sent the largest number of the government officials it is estimated that maybe one third of the Chinese government officials in Tibet was sent across Tibet into the rural areas. That's a huge number of, 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 um, of government officials sending, being sent to the villages. So they, they basically so they like this, they, they go to the village, they distribute Chinese government, Chinese national flag, the portrait of the great leaders, and they tell them to hang it there, and they make the villagers, in, in sometimes in small villages, when, where there's only a few number of households, they would select number of a, a person that they think is progressive, and, uh, and appointed him as the, the local village head or party member, so that he can keep an eye on the rest of the villagers, and just in case that anything happened to him or his thought, because this is thought that they try to control all the time, so that this somebody else can report to the government, and this somebody who has different thought in the mind will be in trouble. And this is what they try to do there. And of course, the nomad in the rural area of Tibet and and distributing the national flags to them. And at some point, that shows this insecurity in the psyches of the Chinese. They have to constantly do this. To the point it's to us, or maybe to many Tibetans in such Tibet, even to the Chinese who are doing this now, it's so ridiculous. They feel like, does that work? But then they feel like they have to do this repeatedly, one after another. And uh, so at some point, this insecurity is there in their mind constantly. That's why they always have this, this so they, they have this sort of what we call the, the disease of our possessiveness. And they won't always tell you that you belong to me, you belong to me, all the time. And that's why China will call Tibet, China's Tibet. I don't think America will call, America's California, kind of thing, but anyway, I don't know if that's a good example, but that's, you know, China's Tibet. And they publish magazines, which actually, you can find in your, uh, in the Chinese consulate in your country, you go to those consulates, there was always a magazine called China's Tibet in different languages. You can check it out, actually. It's quite fun to, what, to read it. And uh, with this kind of understanding, then you read that magazine and you find so much fun to, you know, go through. <laughs> and uh, yes, of course, apart from the, 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 the Tibetans grown ups, and then we should also try to take care of the younger generation or the, the Tibetan children. And uh, we, we should try to brainwash them, try to tell them what it is like, you know. So China started this uh, campaign, you know, among the schools in Tibet as well. And uh, I don't know if I have here. Yeah, no, I don't have it here. So this is the, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party boss in Tibet. Here at Tibet, I mean Tibetan Autonomous Region. So, which is always a uh, Chinese who is the number one boss in Tibet, all across Tibet, the government official. So, that's during one of his visits to a middle school in Tibet, and he said, well, the school authority should carry out patriotic education in the school and develop Communist Party members in the school among students so that in the future they can be the, uh, the backbones of the uh, for construction of the socialist new Tibet. And so the Tibetan kids are not spared at all, of course. And then the soldiers, between the soldiers and uh, the people, how about the relationships between the soldiers and, uh, and the Tibetan, the common people of Tibetans. And so they have this kind of a portrait showing, you know, Tibetans presenting them a cup of tea and so on. And the caption of this actually said very funny. And it says, this, this, this picture I got from one of Chinese news media. And it, the caption says, a cup of hot butter tea 
offered to the People's Liberation Army represent the long-lasting friendship like fish and water between the people, Tibetan people and the People's Liberation Army. Especially, it represents the Tibetan people's tremendous gratitude towards the Communist Party. And that's the caption goes. And then, of course, not just this alone, there's more captions like that. And this poor old woman got some donations from the People's Liberation Army, a set of rice and some maybe, yeah, that's, that's the military use, the canned food and so on. And this, uh, the caption says, Ama Tsirinla, supposedly that's her name, is so moved to see the People's Liberation Army has brought her rice, flour, and milk powder. So basically the reason I'm trying to talk, uh, show this is, apart from many propagandas that we know and we kind of know that what China is doing inside Tibet, and hardly many people outside Tibet or outside China you know, really have an understanding of uh, what it is really like there, and uh, this is the reason I try to pull together a number of slideshows so that we can have some understanding what it is, what they say, what they usually every day say. And this is the kind of propaganda that feel that's there in every day's life of the Tibetans inside Tibet, in the form of music, on TV, in print, everywhere, on the street, for example, this one is quite actually a chilling reminder of how brutal Chinese occupation Tibet in, of Tibet is till today. And the banner on the back actually, this part that was blocked by umbrella, but we can't see the Chinese, but then we can see the Tibetan part. This is quite actually shocking. It says, I don't know if this makes sense in English, it literally, trans literally it says in translation, it says, the gun listened to me and I listen to the party. Or in another world, I have the control over my gun, that's from the soldier right anyway, and, uh, but I will listen to what the Communist Party will say. So this is really a chilling reminder of what the situation is like inside Tibet. And apart from that, there's you know, more of other resistance that's been going on inside Tibet all the time, and that's another totally different topic. I'm, going to, I'm not going to talk about today here. And uh, with this, I actually think that's enough. But just try to remind you that this is just a tiny fraction of the our propaganda that is there inside Tibet from the time they came to Tibet till today, and it's going on inside Tibet forever so we will be able to go back to Tibet, to a free Tibet. And I'll try to just throw a light into this from those number of slideshows and here. And lastly, I would like to, when I was talking about resistance and the spirit of Tibetans, we never die. And it's actually growing stronger. And so with this, this is a musical band inside Tibet called Great Dragon. And they have, their, their music is quite really nice. And with one of their lyrics that I will actually just stop here and can I go to next. Anyway, it went all the way up there. Anyway, you can see that. And the Larry says that we are the sharp wisdom that your speeches and lectures haven't reached. We are the smooth darkness that your flame and power hasn't absorbed. We are the response with the playfulness that makes your heart ache. We are the infection and fright to your livelihood. Thank you. Well, if you have any questions, you can really ask. <laughs> yes. Uh, you primarily addressed the internal propaganda in Tibet and in China as a whole. As far as the external propaganda goes, there seems to be only one real justification, not the poverty of Tibet, not corruption. The real justification that they give with legitimacy is that Tibet was a part of China. Now, what is the basis for that claim, that Tibet was a part of China? Well, the thing is, okay, 
that part of the history is quite complicated. And from what I understand is, okay, first of all, China claimed that Tibet is part of China since uh, the time of Tang Dynasty, that's the seventh century, you know, during those times, because we married our princes to your king. But then, think of this. In China, during those times, during empire's time, if another country is conquering your country as a compromise of, no, not to invade your country, as a compromise, they always marry their, marry their princes, their daughters, to the king of that in, invading country. As, you know, so, okay, don't invade us, we marry our daughter to you. And that's, that's one of the logic they always try to say. If that, that is the reason that should stand, then Nepal should claim that Tibet is part of Nepal before China, because we married, the, our king married the Nepalese princess before the Chinese came to Tibet. And that's one thing. And then secondly, they again it comes to this Yuan dynasty that's like a few centuries later during those times that Tibet is part of China because we conquered too and so on. And during those times, Yuan was actually ruled by Mongolians, the descendant of the, 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 the Chinese Khans. And then it should be the Mongolians to do that, right? And then later on, they're talking about the Qing Dynasty, but this varies, they always varies. You know, long before they used to talk about Tang Dynasty, sometimes they think, well, maybe that's not really strong enough, convincing enough, let's change to Yuan Dynasty. <laughs> sometimes they go through the Qing Dynasty, which is before the Chinese Revolution, you know, the modern Chinese Revolution, the last dynasty in China. That was ruled by Manchus, but not at all by Chinese. So it should be the Manchurians. That's my, what, what I understand. But then, throughout those centuries of history, Tibet has been living in this plateau for a thousand years with our own cultural, different uh, religion uh, and uh, way of life uh, and the language. That's really totally different from Chinese today. And in any way, there's no reason that for China to claim that Tibet is part of China. That's what I understand, but there's more bigger issues behind I've read a number of books but about it, but that's what I least understood from reading all this. Um, I have a question. Are there any um, parties or voices within the Tibetan community, community that calls for um, cooperation with China? And on the other hand, are there any voices for violent resistance? Here or there? Inside uh, Tibet? There, in Tibet. In Tibet? Yes. Any parties? No, no, no parties at all, first of all. No parties allowed to, you know, set up the internet under communist rule. Communist is the only party, that, or the, they call the legitimate party that party can represent, of... like a group or anything like that, yeah. right? Thinking. Yeah, there has been resistance all the time. During those times of 40s, uh, when Chinese started coming to Tibet, there were, you know, we called four ranges, six rivals, right? Mm -hmm. Four ranges, six rivers. It's a resistance group. They're fighting with the Chinese, you know, with guns and everything. And later on, among Tibetans nowadays, for example, we have this kind of, uh, I won't say like a resistance group, but uh, this, co um, what's the word, you know, like uh, among the people, you know, people, you cannot do anything or say anything against Chinese government, not at all. You'll be ended in jail. But then there are also, among the people, they started all this sort of uh, uh, show of defiance by telling everybody in the family that we're not going to speak Chinese, we are going to learn Tibetans, because we are Tibetans. Because that's a safe, safe, safe way, in a way, to express your, you know, cultural identity. That of uh, uh, show of defiance to the Chinese government. Say, so, well, in the village, we're gonna set up voluntarily a group of people. We're gonna learn Tibetan language. On this certain day, we're not gonna speak. We're not gonna mix Chinese in our Tibetan. If we will mi mix it, we're gonna find him. And this kind of a movement is going on. Even in the writings, in the form of writing, using metaphors. And now there's Chinese singers singing songs in the form of metaphors. Of course, like I said, they never can openly say anything they want to say. And saying, like, uh, we're waiting for the, 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 the sun that's gone, long gone, to rise again inside Tibet in the form of music and art. And they are 
these things going on. But of course, you should always try to be careful to walk this thin line. Once you cross that, that that's the end of you. Self-immolations? Yes, absolutely. Self-immolation mm -hmm. is a very drastic act of expressing their, you know, disagreement with what's going on inside Tibet. And uh, for that, I really, I mean, I appreciate it. I, I respect it. No, I mean, I respect the courage and, you know, but on the other hand, you know, I'm not the person, I do not have an authority to judge them or to say if it's right or wrong, you know, living in that kind of environment. Anybody will, will have resorted to that kind of action, action any time. What, what is the answers that usually Tibetan people get if they bring up a subject to Western governments or to the Human Rights Conference in Argo? What they what they're facing with? What are people answering them? That it's well, like, you can't really see it like coming up in like, like, you, know, you don't really like hear about it a lot. You don't hear a lot about it because we hear a lot about it, but you, you can like hear like you know like leaders speaking about it, saying if they, you know. Well, leaders can support it. Giving, um, honestly speaking, it's quite sad to see what the countries around the world is doing when it comes to Tibet today and this age when China's economy is growing <coughs> and growing and you know forever and uh, there has been support a, a really good support from general publics across the world but when it comes to the government it is it's, it's <coughs> always uh, complicated I would I would really never complain to them for not supporting us I understand because you have to Obama has to create jobs in America and he has to do business with China and there's no problem with that. So he's not going to meet Dalai Lama or he's not going to say anything about Tibet. I totally understand. And just recently, China's president is in Europe and meeting with, uh, in Germany, you know, going to have, Jen was telling me that, have a dinner with a uh, uh, German chancellor and everything. You know the bilateral trade deal between Germany and uh, China is $200 billion. They're not going to just throw it because of Tibet. But then at the end of the day, I feel, you know, you have a free country, your country was, you know, built on the idea of respect, liberty and freedom. And if that's the thing that you respect, and it's just all your consciousness that speaks. What about the human rights, the UN human rights? Uh, the, uh, With uh, China in the voting, what's the, the, the three, five kind of security council, it's quite difficult. Actually. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Crimea issue is now actually is a big headache for UN, and I don't think Tibet really matters to them at all. And also, just 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 some. This is just what's happening inside Tibet, all right? And uh, but then China's what China called the soft power is exiting. They have money. They can throw a huge sum of money all across the world. And in 2012, there's. This officially launched what they call CCTV America. CCTV is not the CCTV, okay? It's Chinese Central Television, and this is one of the biggest, you know, television. I mean, anyway, that's all government run, you know, state-sponsored television channel. They officially launched in China, uh, in America, in Washington. And so maybe if you're from America or South America or those parts, you turn your TV and use CCTV America in English. And uh, they, now they are actually absorbing all those prestigious kind of uh, journalist or news person from Japan that they used to work for Al Jazeera, BBC, and say, okay, we pay you more, get that benefit, come to work with us. And they they are exciting this soft power around the globe nowadays. And they, at some point, it, it ended it curtailing the influence of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan Freedom Movement uh, abroad as well, not just within in, inside Tibet. And then they set up all those Confucius Institute. It's a, in, you know, they call it a cultural exchange uh, NGO. 
you know, in the name of one of the Chinese great Chinese scholar Confucius. So they call that institute is, you know, set up in number of universities across the world, and they say, well, we want to tell you what Chinese culture is, teach you Chinese language, but then this report that this is directly under the the, the leadership of the Chinese embassies in those respective countries, and they get. And then they say, okay, if the university is going to host a talk with the Dalai Lama or any Tibet related, we're going to stop sponsoring the, the program. That's like withdrawing one million dollars. And then people have to stop it, you know, to talk to the Tibetans. And this is how they try to curtail the, in, the, the, the Tibetan freedom movement abroad using the money power, you know. Is there any, what can individuals do? A lot, actually. <laughs> you know, how should I say, where should I start? There's, there's a lot you can do, and you can go back to your country, you can try to talk with your friend about Tibet. At least that people will have some idea about what the whole thing is going on, this Tibet and China thing, you know. And you can, you know, that, that, that when you, in, in, wherever you're from, that place, if you see some, sort of a Chinese, Chinese like to organize this sort of Chinese government, to be precise, and uh, like to organize this sort of a cultural show and uh, exchange, you know, program, and you can always tell them this is their propaganda, this is how they try to tell people, this is one thing you can try to, you know, do, and always try to, even share a link on Facebook can always help, in a way. There are TSG sold over the world. Yeah, there's Tibet support groups all over the world. If you check on in your area, in your country, there, there might be Tibet group, Tibet, you know, groups around, and you can try to be part of it. And then you can also try to sponsor kids in Tibetan children's village school too. It's just like a fifty dollars a year or something like that. I guess it's not that much. Yeah, but there's many ways, really many ways individuals can do, and that mm -hmm. is because of the consciousness of the individuals around the world. I'm not talking about the countries that, of course, you know that the 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 free Tibet, the Tibetan movement, you know, lasts this long, and uh, partly go all to the support from the individuals around the world. Honestly speaking. Any more questions? It's a, it's a political... Would they stop their indoctrination? Well, it's a, well, if that's a genuine middle way is achieved, then, then there will be much more freedom for the future to be Tibetan government in the area to, you know, administrate the region. So in that way, I mean, in the, you know, in many ways we can try to curtail the influence of Chinese government in the area. But then, on the other hand, what I'm saying is, it's a political struggle, a political goal that we try to achieve. And then, at the end of the day, it's politics. And when it's politics, you always have to give some concessions to get some more from that. It's a win-win situation. You cannot always say, well, that's all I need, that's all I'm going to have, without giving any concessions. Throughout the history, we know this kind of concessions have been given to between countries in order to achieve their political goals. So that's, I guess, in some way we can try to do. And uh, so far, this is the best way, I, at least I believe. But then, as an individual Tibetan, I try, truly do not believe the Chinese government whatsoever. I do not want to be with them at all. I mean, Chinese people, fine, but no matter. But I, as an individual Tibetan, I do not want to have that. But then, on the other hand, we're fighting to go home. That's the only thing. We're not trying to you know, certain beautiful 
glorious example to the world about non-violence and democracy or anything. We're not. That's not, re- not, not, not the reason we came to India at all from the first place. All we want to do is just go home. We try to do that. But are genuinely administered by us at that kind of home. So I guess as an individual, I, I don't like it. I won't trust them. But as a political goal, you always have to give concessions to get some out of it, right? I guess that's it, right? Okay. <laughs> On behalf of uh, Tibet Museum, I would like to thank Mr. Tenzin Rosen for his time and uh, the great presentation and for sharing us the information. And he has taken, right from, uh, taken us right from uh, Chinese invasion in Tibet and then cultural revolution, petrolative re-education and the Chinese propaganda they do, they do in uh, Tibet. And, uh, so it was an interesting talk, uh, talk, talk and made this session very interesting. And I would like to also thank all of you for coming here and giving interest in knowing more about Tibet and standing for Tibet, for Tibet's cause. Thank you so much. And I would like to offer oh, him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.